Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Richard Move here with a very special guest. Yeah, I'm Nita Ingvarsson, choreographer and dancer from, uh, well, Denmark, but living in Belgium. Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's talk about Belgium for a moment. Yeah. I'm very curious to know. You started this work, Red Pieces, and co to come in 2005. So yeah. that was right around the time you finished at Parts. That's right. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the impetus for it, mm -hmm. how maybe it connected to your studies, that moment in your life, mm -hmm. and this idea that it's been, what's that, 14, 15 years? Yeah, that's now a long time ago. Yes, and how it's evolved. Yeah. Well... Um, while I was still in school, I made, let's say, my first pieces, which were two rather um, small pieces, but where I was dealing with nudity. Um, I was um, dealing with questions around how to create an androgynous uh, body, also because in my um, youth years, I was very often mixed up. I'm very tall, mm -hmm. strong. People thought I was a boy, a man. Uh, I had many uh, issues around this confusion mm -hmm. that I somehow needed to... Mm, think about and so I made those first works uh, where one of them is actually a work where we were wearing masks mm. on our back heads and then naked so it would look as if the head was turned oh. 180 degrees around um, and our bodies became we were three women doing that but the men were the masks were of old men so it was a kind of weird mixture but it started looking like um, kind of um, almost like animals or like um, monstrous kinds of um, mixes mm. and very androgynous it's kind of difficult to identify mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the bodies so that was while I was still in school these questions were very um, strong we had also it was also the time in Europe where uh, Gilles Deleuze was a very big reference so there was a, we, we were I was reading a lot of uh, Bodies without organ had all these oh, theor theoretical uh -huh. references at the time um, that I'm not s so uh, closely working with anymore. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was a it was a strong. I was very impacted mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by reading uh, those theories. And uh, I made another piece also where I was alone and again naked and dealing with um, questions around affect uh, and expression. And I wrote something that at the time uh, called the Yes Manifesto, which was, of course, a mm -hmm. reference to Ivan Reiner's No Manifesto. And I was trying to think about how to uh, be affirmative uh, instead of saying no to everything, trying right. to actually affirm things. And so to come, came out of that, came out of um, thinking about how, how to um, affirm, um, let's say, um, different kinds of sexual uh, understanding, so working with the idea of the orgy as a kind of um, potentially critical way of looking at family structures, mm -hmm. um, because obviously like um, family structures are still dominant uh, models of life mm -hmm. here in New York, maybe a little less than, <laughs> mm -hmm. than uh, but still, it's, it still remains um, a, a very clear frame. And at the time when I was 25, I had a lot of questions around that, mm -hmm. a lot of questions around whether having a family or that kind of model would ever fit me or not. Um, and then also having uh, questions about, more politically speaking, how uh, society kind of um, tells bodies how, how we have to um, move, be, interact, mm -hmm. um, and how we could potentially undo mm -hmm. those structures. Just to pick up on the Yes Manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Like Rainers, were you referring to your art, to dance, yeah. to life, a bit of all of that? It was um, very clearly related, because actually uh, at the time I was working with a um, theater maker called Jan Ritzema, and he said no to a lot of things. Okay. Uh, and it was in a way part of an influence of of uh, of the No Manifesto that came a little late in <laughs> mm. <laughs> in in Europe, um, and I had been working with him. I loved working with him, and I I appreciated uh, and I still appreciate his way of thinking about uh, theater making very much. 
but I had a feeling that everything p had to pass through the no and not actually mm. through a, a kind of proposition and so I also I, I was dealing looked at the no manifesto and I thought uh, so it's basically like I actually know it because it's in one of my pieces where I actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. redo it says so like basically yes to redefining virtuosity yes to invention okay. uh, yes to conceptualizing affect sensation and experience mm -hmm. uh, yes to materiality and body practice uh, yes to um, uh, expression and also like decoding and recoding expression. I was very busy with like how, for instance, sexual bodies, they appear everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I had the idea in 2005 that we become uh, immunized, like immune mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to those kinds of images that they actually don't stimulate mm. anything in us anymore when mm -hmm. we look mm -hmm. at them. Um, so a kind of saturation of, of, of imagery. And then I thought, is it possible to actually push the saturation so far, like so sex, like put it mm -hmm, really mm -hmm, explicit. Mm -hmm. So that's where this idea of doing this orgy sculpture mm -hmm, came mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. So to say, can we make it so explicit and then in a way refuse to use the orgasmic or climactic structures mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that those images so often come with? Yes. Also in pornography and in, mm -hmm. in, in let's say, even in Hollywood movies, that mm -hmm. it's kind of always about orgasm. Sure. So I was trying to get out of that. And uh, and so at that time, it was uh, partly based on a, a more like uh, trying to understand my own body also. Uh, and partly trying to understand the societal condition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I feel like now, like 15 years later, it's... it's uh, I started being interested in sexuality again the moment that I got children. So you could say it was actually again the moment, it was a personal thing where I was like, why do everyone now wants me to be a mother who needs to stay at home with my children when actually <laughs> that's not, mm. it, like it was difficult for me to have the that kind of um, external gaze. Uh, but it became even more about how societal structures are actually uh, producing certain kinds of expectations mm -hmm. that we feel comfortable or not yes, comfortable yes, yes. with. So you have children. I have two children, uh, and um, and uh, that I love and love to be with and of so course. on. But I'm also, uh, of course, uh, I'm also an internationally touring artist who is hardly at home, and so right. I'm negotiating how mm -hmm. to have children in that and kind your of unique life. Way. Yeah. And it's not so easy, mm -hmm. I imagine. Uh, so it's quite a challenging uh, thing and I have to deal also with a lot of other people thinking that I shouldn't do that or right. can't do this and that's not good and you, you know like all the ideas about what children should have right. in terms of that are kind of imposed from the outside. Yeah, yeah. and the school systems and the, like actually right. you understand that all the societal structures are based actually on a certain idea about parents should be at home, mm -hmm, live together mm -hmm, preferably mm -hmm. because that's more stable. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But no one does it anymore. Everyone yeah. is like precarious, yeah. working different jobs, trying to find a way. So yes. there's something not um, corresponding, I find, in, in those things. So I came back to it and then also starting to think about society again, saying like, we're okay, in the meanwhile, um, the internet has kind of exploded, the social media wave right. has come. I think that was just starting, I guess. Yeah. yeah, like 2007, yeah, you know, yeah, like, so the yeah. whole Facebook and the whole Instagram and all those kinds of, um, let's say, explosions of self-expression. Yes, like yes. Like now we have to show ourselves. Yes. And be, like, unique, but everyone is unique in the same way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on these platforms that are so standardized mm -hmm, actually mm -hmm, in terms mm -hmm. of how to express. So I thought, ah, these blue suits all of a sudden had a whole new meaning mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because it had to do with taking away this self-expression mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, side mm -hmm. or trying to, to also, of course, take away, because for me, but I don't know, like when, when we wear the suits, it's also a big uh, liberation to actually not have to deal right. with who am I with? What's this relation right. about? What does like, my face look yeah, like at this and moment? Do I actually like this? Because also you don't really feel the difference between one body I and imagine, another. Yes. Because the, the surface, like you still can smell things. You can still, of course, feel uh, genitals and like you, you can still, of course, identify mm -hmm. the body, but it takes much longer because when you're doing, uh, we've been doing lots of different exercises while wearing these suits. 
and most of them are about losing your sense of um, orientation. Why are the suits blue? Yeah, good question. Well, that comes from 2005 also. So at the time I was um, very interested in cinema and blue key and green key. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I thought it might have to do with kind of the glow of the television. Yeah. Perhaps. Actually, it or came. Or blue movies. Yeah, exactly. It came. It, well, the blue movies is for sure one reference. And then this blue key screens that where you shoot a film and then afterwards you replace the background mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. another image. Right. So it had to do with like, this thing, like how to make the body into a. Um, surface that you can project Right, a on. projection surface. Yeah. yeah, I think that comes through. Mm. And then how d has the work grown since to come mm -hmm. and then to come extended? Well, at the time it was for five people Okay. and there was no nudity in it. Ah. So we were actually wearing uh, like clothing that somehow represented some sort of party. Uh, so when I wanted to redo it, I didn't know yet that we were going to be naked, but the dancers who are in it, they did another piece with me called Seven Pleasures, which is also part of the red the, pieces. The red pieces. Um, and so in that piece, we were all they were all naked, me too, when I was part of it. Um, and so I knew that they were a group who were interested mm -hmm, also mm -hmm. in working in that way with each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in a way... Uh, Interested in working in that way with each other. What do you mean? Well, uh, so because being naked um, together at, in your workplace, uh, that's kind of a choice that you need to make. Yes, it uh, is. Whether you want to do that or mm -hmm. not. And I think for many dancers, it's not a given. I think for some people, it's a curiosity and a desire to try, but not necessarily. So How did you negotiate that with yeah, these dancers? For me, it was very important when I uh, started, because I've done many pieces naked on my own. Yes. And that's, of course, unproblematic. A different story, yeah. I decide to do it and that's it. Uh, but so I thought in doing, in wanting to work with a group, I thought it was very important that there would be um, a contractual agreement. I don't mean really a written one. There, mm -hmm. there was a written one also, but I mean more like really in, in the sense of how for instance, in BDSM practices, you would you would sign right. an agreement about what what do we do, what do we not yeah, do, yeah, and yeah. so so the invitation uh, was very clear. I said I want to work with nudity, I want to work with sexual representation. I'm not particularly interested in penetration. It was clear that it was not about doing a, a let's say a pornographic what would usually be in a porn film right. on stage. I was like not so interested in that. Uh, but trying to explain um, my interest in, in looking um, at sexual practices and how to propose other ones than the ones we know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to see how that would produce choreography. Like how could we actually think about movement practices as kind of sexual practices or sensual or erotic mm -hmm, or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them. Um, so that was a letter that I wrote to all of them with an invitation to do a one-week workshop and without knowing whether we would go on or right. not. So in a way it was like it was not an audition because I don't think I never did auditions and I and for this piece it felt particularly mm. wrong to do one. So it was more uh, some of the people I already worked with before some of them I had met in different contexts like workshops and so I had mm -hmm. a kind of already uh, some level of, of um, new knowing them. Yes. And so the invitation was, come for one week, let's work like this, and afterwards everyone can decide right, right. whether they want to do the work <coughs> or not. And, uh, and so we did that, and, uh, and yeah, in the end, almost everyone um, stayed yeah. to actually do the show. And for me, it was immediately clear that this group of people could do this together, mm without it w we had lots of discussions lots of issues lots of things to figure out but without it being conflictual mm. and for me that was on some level important um to in a way uh, obviously because right after we made the piece or in the middle of it the whole me too hashtag me too movement gonna, also yeah also happened so it's like it was a big um in a way for me uh yeah, no, so Seven Pleasure was right before. But there was something about it. It all of a sudden became clear that working on these things in an explicit way um, was 
possible and I did workshops even with students where we were also naked and really and it didn't not in the States (laughs) no exactly (laughs) so but in Europe that was possible at the time and I I'm not sure I would redo it today Mm. after the the interesting I mean because uh, although I think I mean I've spoken to many of the students after and they all loved it so it was but still um, and I think that's part of the work also. So mm-hmm. how can we be together mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in intimate ways um, without it being about abuse and violence and um, going over each other's borders? And right. So how do we set up safe spaces? How do we negotiate working physically together while being naked? How do we mention when something is too much? How do we s- tell someone <laughs> when they went over the limit? You know. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so we try to make it really. Um, part of the work that uh, I would give quite clear frames and everyone would know that we don't go outside of these frames when we experience. What's an example of that? Well, for instance, we have one, we call it viscosity. So in that thing, we are naked. We, we try to imagine that we are liquid okay. and we kind of, we, we go on the, on the sofa and on the, it's like, it's like a, an, an, in an interior. Okay. Uh, the peace place in that kind of interior setting. So, and then we go on each other also, and you will sometimes have like people's genitals in your face, and you try to deal with the other body as a non human liquid, mm. which means you try not to identify that, no, now I have the genitals of someone right. in my face, but you try to actually. Um, treat and of course it's impossible because we are humans who will yes. who d- so but but in a way the exercise is to try to get um, away from that kind of thinking where the genitals are both a source of uh, anxiety and mm. pleasure and you know like that that there is a that that somehow it would be possible to be with people you you don't necessarily have a sexual relationship with in that intimate way um, without it being problematic and of course it's also a source of lots of humor and fun and mm-hmm. difficulty and be like oh now it's really too much and mm. how, how do we handle that what's um, it like do you feel that the uh, the women that you're working with respond somehow differently or is there some kind of gender difference in this process do you find I don't know um, uh, for example do you find the women are more receptive than the men can you even make a call like that? I'm just curious. Well, um, I, I, I wouldn't say, but we, of course, the question of, of uh, excitement, or because if a man is excited, there is an erection involved, or mm. could be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and with a woman, it's impossible to necessarily mm-hmm. see it physically. So that was a discussion. What if that happens? It never actually happened, because the practices we worked with were so um, bizarre that I think it, in a way it was about trying to invent other kinds of pleasures mm-hmm. uh, and in a way get a bit away from this focus on, on genitalia right. as the kind of... Right, as the only fo- access yeah, point for yeah, intimacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question. There's a one version of the piece where... So in the tableaus of the orgy in the blue suits, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, it's very hard to distinguish between mm-hmm. the genders. Mm-hmm. It's, which is kind of a wonderful, liberating mm, mm. thing, I believe. Then we have the, in this version I've seen on video, mm-hmm. um, which I know is has evolved even more for the version here at Skirball this mm-hmm. weekend, mm-hmm. the partnering mm-hmm. to the social dancing is mm-hmm. very um, hetero. Yeah. The men are partnering the women. Yeah. Um, and there isn't much interchange of the genders there. That's and not I true. <laughs> no, it's true that it's true that. So basically, in the two thousand and five version, it's true that there. Uh, I wanted to go back to um, a social dance, where the gender roles would be clearly divided in order to actually undo them. So basically, the composition in the two thousand and five, but maybe even more in the new version there's a kind of uh, circulation. And also in the new version, uh, there are also um, f- n- women who are in the leader's positions uh-huh, uh-huh. and uh, men who are in the fol- follower uh-huh, positions. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that has changed slightly from okay. the, the, pre- the, the first version. But the idea with the first version was already 
that you take actually we took three materials so sexual interaction orgasm and a kind of um, couple dance which are clearly identifiable as something you do in two kind of in a way uh, heteronormative and then we try to make them into these orgiastic circulations so there is a kind of um, in the first version there's there's three people circulating with, mm -hmm. which are the women mm -hmm. in that case but uh, there's also a moment where everyone is circulating mm -hmm. so we undo the, the couple dance to be something you actually mm -hmm. do on mm -hmm. your own and in the new version there's like yeah there's more crossover in the sense that mm -hmm. um, the leader follower which is actually the reason why I chose that dance in the first place the, the, the social yeah, dances yeah, yeah. because um, it already in the 1930s when the dance was developed um, within the Afro-American communities in the States, the Lindy Hop, there was a uh, fluidity so it could be the leaders and the followers mm -hmm. were actually um, interchangeable at the time already which was very unusual. That's you know, advanced, very, very early, sophisticated. Yeah. 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 So that was one of the, the reasons why I found it so interesting to work with that dance in particular. So. Yes, tell us about that because it's really, it's so interesting to look at because I feel like the music, yeah, to me feels like swing sixties, yeah. maybe late fifties. But that's then we earlier, see yeah, the yeah. Lindy Hop aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a bit earlier. Yeah. Tell us about those choices. Well, um, well now I don't know when exactly Sing 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 is from, but I guess it's earlier than fifties. I would have to look it up. Um, well. It, the idea was uh, to, to in a way, mm, also in terms of the, like, um, let's say, swing dance is very often used as a little number to give energy. Yes. <laughs> and in a way, so the idea was to say, okay, can we actually, which is again an orgasmic structure, right, that exists in theater, but mm -hmm. also in films. And mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. so the idea was to make a piece where these peaks would somehow be taken out. Mm -hmm. So you have instead, you have like three sections that each is a kind of plane. So the blue part is very mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. flat and slow and not, mm -hmm. um, not energetic and not peaking. And then you have the orgasm choir, which is like an endless like yes. orgasm over and over again, which is somehow yes, yes. also uh, unusual for that kind of material. And then you have this dance that is then also prolonged into a 20 minute, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. endless somehow. And um, it's kind of at a constant peak. And it's kind of constantly yeah. up there all yeah. the time. And there is a little dip because we simply, you know, I wanted yeah. it to be like really long. And in order for that to be possible, there had to be this Right. little dip in um, in speed but uh, nevertheless there was the idea about how to resist those little peaks by mm. creating these different planes mm -hmm. that would propose another kind of dramaturgical um, so also thinking about how how structures also sexual and how are they climactic and how does those kind of climaxes also speak about a, a specific form of sexual orientation mm. So to try to undo that inside mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the piece itself, that was that was one um, idea, and then also the fact that the the music is looped, which creates kind of frustration. So you have like they're supposed to be da 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 da, but right. it's not a coming. Refrain, like a it's chorus. Like, so. It's it's like going and it's not going, and then when it finally comes and it's set, then it doesn't go anywhere else, but it kind of stays there. So it there was the idea of, of working exactly with. Um, in a way, those cultural inscriptions um, of of how our bodies are so used to responding to a music mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that, and then try to frustrate, like so that that kind of climax it doesn't come. And then all it, when it comes, it it happens in a totally different right. way. Right, I think that's super clear. Mm -hmm. Is anyone in the cast um, from the one of the early versions? Uh, there's Manon who was in the early version, but she's now a replacement, so she's not here now, but she's dancing it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the only one who who carried over. I asked all of them, but it it was not, um, yeah. It was clear that some, some like uh, Jefter, for instance, Van Dinze, he's now a choreographer, very, mm -hmm. very busy with mm -hmm. his own work, so it was clear that he wouldn't have time for it. and uh, And myself well I'm not in this piece because mm -hmm. it's so big and so visual that someone needs to be outside sure uh, and yeah the other like so yeah we didn't uh, Mano is the only one who carried through for 
from one to the other. Who were some of the artists that uh, became kind of sources of inspiration for you, for this work in particular, or for the red pieces? Yeah. I mean, in the red pieces there, Karoli Schneemann has been very important. Mm -hmm. I even had this uh, direct um, yes. exchange uh, with her, and I guess for obvious reasons, because her work has been so... Um, well, in the 60s, so strongly um, addressing questions around sexuality mm -hmm. and explicit representation also. Yes. Um, but for this piece in specific, I remember we were looking a lot at the engravings of, um, like they were uh, printed together with uh, narratives of Marquis de Sade or stories of mm. uh, Marquis de Sade, which are really these like almost fictional, you have like orgiastic kind of, um, constellations of bodies and mm -hmm, you somehow mm -hmm. think it's impossible so for instance when we create the ass pile with the four asses on top of each other then that's actually a, something we saw on these images and I was wow. like that's impossible I don't think that would work and then we tried and it did work so, <laughs> so that kind of um, yeah unlikely um, Im like you think actually it's someone who has imagined that but then you realize that maybe not Right, right. Uh, then there's also some references more really to visual art and sculpture because obviously it's a very mm -hmm. sculptural. So the Chapman mm -hmm. brothers, for instance, who do these um, mixed up bodies and then with noses that look like penises and sneakers on, like really weird sculptures. Okay. I, li I like them all, a lot. Um, and there's also another sculpture um, of an artist, I think he's called Charles Ray, which is basically a eight copies of himself in a like made in wax and kind of doing an orgy it's a very weird piece oh interesting with one one person, one body one one person being reproduced so very clearly some self um, very weird i thought better not do the self thing better just it's <laughs> interesting though <laughs> find the find the anonymous uh, side but yeah it's in, it's really interesting so there's a few of those references Lots of references, but yeah. Mm -hmm. What about in literature? Um, mm, well, I think, I mean, in 2005, because in a way now also the new version is still based on the same. I was really, I was reading a lot of uh, Mille Plateaus, so a thousand okay. plateaus. That a was really, plateaus. that was really sure. uh, strong. I mean, I was totally into that when I was 25. Um, that, that was a very strong reference. I'm someone who is, um, I would love to read fiction, but I have no patience for it. So mm -hmm. I read theory because it's denser and I get into it. Mm -hmm. like I can read theory for hours and I can't, like I just, with fiction, I very easily get. Right. So in that sense, there's more. Um, I was also reading the Foucault's uh, History of Sexuality, Sexuality right. uh, books. And I, I was, yeah, so um, in a way trying to, trying to understand the kind of social cultural heritage and actually also because in Foucault there's also a lot about trying to understand also the, the place that religion has played in mm -hmm. the formation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of how guilt and shame and all these things are, yes. are you know playing out uh, so I was also interested in that what on that note what's your perception of being here in the States in well, terms yeah. of guilt and shame <laughs> <laughs> and the place of religion <coughs> and sexuality yeah. and informing our views about the body, about sexual liberation or not, um, well, about pleasure. So I didn't know what to expect. I've shown the three other because there's four pieces in the red like the mm. more recent ones and I have been showing them in different places here in New York and Seven Pleasures was shown also two yes. years ago so in a way I was I was not um, so I've been through I, I felt with the previous works that w there was a certain reservation um, oh yeah reservation and with this one not so actually yesterday I was very surprised that in the audience there was a kind of very humorous, like people were laughing, and it's like really usually in the blue part, it might happen, like there's a few places in the blue mm -hmm, part mm -hmm. where people have fun, but usually it's more like people are observing, and like mm -hmm, looking mm -hmm. at discoveries very slow. And yesterday there was lots of reactions. Oh, nice. And that was really interesting. 
I, there is great, I find that there's great humor in the yeah, piece. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the orgasm choir, yeah, is that what you yeah, call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, I think, hilarious. It is hilarious, yeah. No, so that actually, yes, they thought, ah, oh, yeah, well, there's also people with a lot of humor, and in a way with a certain, um, so sometimes laughter can be about distancing sure, and yourself. Sure, about discomfort and actually, yeah, or this kind of reaction like, <laughs> to <laughs> like, discomfort. You're a little bit like not sure what to think, so you laugh it away. I didn't feel that yesterday. I felt that it was really more genuine, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. enjoyment of, of the more um, fun side uh, of the piece. Have you taken this, any of the red pieces to other parts of the States? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. So that would Anything be in the works? I'm just curious about the content, the bodies, yeah, and um, Foucault. In I, terms I, I, of ah, the shame and guilt <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, um, well, for me, the, because this piece was really made now. Like the reason to redo it um, for me had to do with. Um, so I started with doing this research on the 60s, again with 69 Positions, which is the first piece in the, mm -hmm. of the red pieces, and where this relationship to sexuality as a tool to protest or in, in the 60s, uh, um, that was a strong mm -hmm. thing, especially here in the US, yes. actually. So, uh, of course, very strong. Um, and so I became very interested in that, and then that kind of carries through uh, in 21 Pornographies, where I'm also dealing with the history in Denmark, because in Denmark we have a history of the pornographic image being liberated in 1967, and after that there was a kind of wave of soft pornographic movies that were made. Mm. Um, but they're still very often, uh, almost all, made by male directors, mm -hmm. so from mm -hmm. they're quite, they're funny, they're comedies, kind of, like, but at the same time also really painful and sometimes there are these crazy scenes where for me there is an, uh, an element of excess that brings it somewhere else which, mm -hmm. which for me has to do something with the, the, the time period in the 60s and 70s where there was a, uh, at least partially a different kind of relationship to the to the body so my mom was really like uh, you know she would walk around in her long dresses without underwear she had this like burn your bra and you know like it right. was a, she, she's really from the the feminist movement in in Denmark and um, and yeah so I, I feel that in a way d redoing to come extended was great because it goes on the the freedom side or the enjoyment side mm -hmm. especially the last part mm -hmm. but at the same time I was also making 21 pornographies which goes really into the the violent size mm -hmm. side of, of sexuality and it felt important actually to do that mm -hmm. simultaneously even though people now see one or the other mm -hmm. <laughs> but but for me those two um, pieces were quite important to make as a kind of flip side of the same coin where to come extended for me is about trying to imagine almost a utopia of how things could be if we were not limited mm -hmm, by the structures mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that are there and sometimes people ask me but uh, this will never happen you know like we can't just like it's it's almost like, the antidote to yeah, 21 pornographies yeah, yeah. have you ever presented the pieces chronologically kind of back to back over a, you know a long week under something yeah, where I just, you'd see yeah um the first piece of mm. the red piece is one night, mm. the next, mm. etc. Mm. I just did that, like, so in uh, this summer in Vienna, a big festival called Impulse Dance, they were the first ones to actually show all of them. Oh, nice. And it was a really um, big experience to do, and I think also for audiences to actually go through mm. all of them, because mm. of course it creates a more complex understanding. Mm -hmm of the, the topics. I think sometimes with To Come Extended, it's uh, it's the most celebratory one of them. And if people only see that one, I sometimes, I, I'm a little bit like, wait, there's, there's a there's lot more. more. There's other sides <laughs> there's to a, There's a lot more to say. Yeah. Uh, because of course, um, exactly the, the naked body is also this place of, of struggle and it's also a place of violence and it's also a mm -hmm. place of difficulty and of, uh, Lots. The, the source <laughs> of uh, lots of um, problems, right? It's not just like oh, let's let's be free and hop around naked. Which, <laughs> so it's it's like uh, yeah, for me it it's in a way it has to be seen also in relation mm -hmm. to this whole. Is there another installment of red pieces? 
Right now, I'm having a break from it because I, I did six years and I, I couldn't read another text about pornography. Like, people also start sending me things like, <laughs> oh, I'm happened, sure. Right? It's like, oh, you should read this and then you should just look at that. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm done. You know, so I, I just made an, another piece now, which where I'm trying to really go in another direction. Which is? Well, um, I, it's a, I'm actually dealing with abstraction. Um, and also with a question around technology and how how technology today has a big impact on our mental structures and our mm -hmm. our mm, moods and states and um, actually let's say our brain 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 plasticity mm -hmm. so <laughs> that's what I'm working on mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it comes out as a quite abstract um, movement work where we are dealing with uh, wireless lit lights that are these like long um, lamps that we move with mm. there, there's a it's nine dancers on stage and um, and for me it has to do with how in a way this let's say technological extensions of the body produces different kinds of social constellations mm -hmm. or f mm, human bodily constellations mm -hmm. that are also abstract at the same time but I do have one last piece that I need to make and I, I and because my first question when I wrote to Karl Uli Schneemann in uh, 2013, it was about um, actually trying to redo Meet Joy mm. 50 years later with the dancers or the performers who had originally done it with her. Wow. So the idea was to actually work with, with aging or quite old mm. uh, bodies and to see how this would actually change the the content of that work, uh, also to maybe talk about something else today than what mm -hmm, we talked mm -hmm, about at the mm -hmm. time, and she didn't want to, and we skipped it, and it. But my idea, because I thought that there's something about uh, sexuality so often um, talked about in young and desiring sure. and flexible and mobile bodies, absolutely, um, and that now actually became the case because it happened that the dancers that was in this workshop. I mean, it's the group that mm -hmm. was on stage yesterday, so it, they're all, I mean, not all of them are dancers, but they're all, let's say, very capable um, bodies. Absolutely. And that's still a question for me, like, it's obviously, there's uh, many other, um, again... There are other kinds of bodies yeah, having yeah, that, intimate that sexual could, relations. And that could be uh, uh, part of the series without, like, it's... Uh, yeah. Now, it's sometimes I think things happen in a certain way, because it has been a question that I've been asked many times, why are the bodies so narrow? And I say, well, there's quite, there's 25 years of difference between the youngest and the oldest. Like the, it's, I still find it a quite a diverse group, but of course I see also that mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not, it, depending on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with which um, pair of glasses you look with. And I think there's something that I still would like to do uh, in, in regards to to thinking about sexuality and how it's represented in mm -hmm. culture, or how it's mm -hmm. actually not non-represented or non-existing. Yeah, um, I think that's super interesting. This notion of um, age mm. and this notion and the ageism that yeah. I guess is yeah. part of yeah. this sexual uh, economy, yeah. if you yeah. will. Yeah. 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 And tell us about everybody. Uh, you mean the project? Uh, yes. The, yeah. Um, so that was a project uh, that I did between, two th was that 2005? I think between 2005 and 2010, mm. but it's an ongoing project that in principle is still ongoing. Right, I thought it would be, yeah. It, it is, like, so we were a, a group of artists, um, and again Jan Ritzema, who was this theater maker that I mm -hmm. worked with uh, when I was in my early 20s. And he opened um, a place called PAF uh, in uh, France, it's, it's in saint -Dame. It's a working place for artists that is self-run and artist-organized. Mm. And I was part of the, let's say, the core group who was part of thinking about what can we do here and qu um, questions around how to use open source uh, mm -hmm. strategies mm -hmm. to kind of think about sharing and a different kind of organization that would be a self-organized, artist-based uh, way of working. Uh, came up very strongly and out of that we were a smaller group of artists so we were 40 or something when it started but we were there was five of us who were thinking then okay how could we actually work on this also um, as a way to think about how do we share 
artistic processes, mm -hmm. what in making art is actually something we can share mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what of it is singular and has to belong to a specific mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. or even a specific person. person. Sure. So that it's not everything that is just, you know, like there's certain things that also have to be singular mm -hmm. because if not mm -hmm. we we don't need to do art, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but we we were thinking about so basically the methodologies, the the sources that we read, the questions that we have. So we we developed this, we devised like a series of um, discursive games or ways of in, interrelating, and it came really out of a need to work together. Mm -hmm. And then we thought it would be interesting to do this more as a platform because it was about sharing. So instead of just saying we are fine and we do it for us, we say we try to actually create it as a platform that mm -hmm. more people, more mm -hmm. artists could be part of. And in that context, we um, did, for instance, like a book where we asked artists to do uh, self-interviews or group interviews in regards to their artistic processes. So and you have these books um, that were made mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it also became a kind of educational platform that all of us would use, but that other people would also use and still use mm -hmm, today mm -hmm. uh, it, for doing workshops. So basically, uh, it it was a what's an example of such a game? Yeah. Well, uh, we have that a, everybody could access. Uh, it, well, we have like so. There's the question game, um, which is like you ask a question, you always answer the question with another question okay we have also these like these writing exercises for instance the self-interview like where you kind of um, use that form as a way to interrogate your own interest in into doing projects mm. we have a game that was actually invented by uh, someone else but that kind of became a, a platform uh, for inventing shows together. It's called Generic. Mm -hmm. So basically you, you sit down on a couch and you're four people and you invent the show that just took place, except it didn't take place. So that's a way of kind of sharing and developing Oh, interesting. Ideas. So you're speaking about it retroactively, yeah. like as so if we, it happened in the past, even though it didn't really it happen. Didn't. Fascinating. Which is really fun. Yeah, I'm it's sure. It's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> because then in certain ways you're yeah. imagining your ideal performance. Exactly. And the ideal affect yeah. and reaction that you would hope to yeah. have. And the conversation you would like to have after yeah, exactly. your best work. Yeah. So And then the audience is actually invited into the same. So they are invited to pretend that they saw the show. And then it's an idea to try to have a... And that's very fun, like, uh, well, it, but it's now also many years ago, 14 years ago, so it's, uh, at a certain point, I felt that I needed um, more in-depth research, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I left those, like, the, let's say, the game structures, I, I needed to leave them behind in favor of other kinds of mm -hmm. writing practices, mm -hmm. and, um, but yeah, it was a strong, I was very busy with that for some five, six mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. years. Yes, tell us about <laughs> Permeable Stage, which you did um, an iteration of at Performance Space New York, what, yeah. two years ago uh, or so? That was when I did, it must have been 17 or 18, anyway, it's not long ago, I can't remember, was it last year? Anyway, uh, I think it was last year. Um, yeah, so the Permeable Stage, it's, um, it's a form that I uh, so I've always been interested in in how um, theory influences artistic practices mm -hmm. then also how discourse becomes performative so I've made mm -hmm. several works where that is actually mm -hmm. what I'm working on to a certain, like I'm always working on some, uh, lots of other things at the same time but um, there was a moment where I thought uh, it would be interesting to create a conference and that would also be a performance at the mm -hmm, same time. Mm -hmm. So the first idea was to do a 10 or 12 hour long conference that would kind of demand a very um, strong engagement from the audience. Mm -hmm. So basically it, the first one was in Brussels and the idea was to invite people to come and spend the day in the theater with a series of talks and performances. And the idea was to try to, um, in a way that the different things would relate to each other but without being explanatory of each other 
And so people would go from, indeed, uh, listening to a theoretical lecture on, I don't know, participation in sure. art, and then go to actually do something where their own body would be involved mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. one way or another. And and I did the two versions, uh, well, two or three, like I've done a pilot version, so the three versions I've did, done of it, the idea was also at the same time to to these that these questions around sexuality would also be addressed in in different ways. So here in New York, it was um, a similar mm. uh, proposal, and because Carol Schneemann finally agreed to meet with me, I was one of the contributors as well. So it's also something about uh, again finding a form where sharing and being in mm -hmm. exchange mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. other artists and also sharing that with an audience. Uh, becomes a kind of form of, of presentation um, and so for instance with Kaoli we were trying to find out how could we in public share the dialogue that we have had over the the last years mm. and we decided to basically show extracts from our works and then discuss them in in different uh, ways um, Isabel Lewis she came to do a piece um, where she's using spoken word, but that people are sitting around in a kind of space with lots of plants. So there was also an idea about working on uh, on the relationship between the sensual and the non-human. Um, so so there was um, yeah, because in Caroli's work, there's also a lot of non-human. Like sure, she has the her kitty cats, cats yeah. and all so kinds she has of that, crit that's critters. A, exactly. That's a that's a, that's a very interesting. So that for me was a, in a way. I've been dealing a lot with non-human in the sense of objects and materials, but I became interested recently in also the non-human as in other forms of life or mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. the life of plants or the lives of, of animals or the and the way we live together or the way we think mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. cross species kind of interactions. So that was a bit the let's say the and technology being one of those non-human. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, elements as well. Uh, so, yeah. What about, have you thought about or done parts of red pieces in not in theatrical venues? For instance, I was thinking, so mm -hmm. I know you're Danish, mm -hmm. so I was thinking of my one trip to Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. and what's the name of that fabulous neighborhood? Um, Christiania. Yes. Bowen, yeah. I don't know. I was just... Why not do it there? Or I was just thinking, yeah. and there's also, um, I don't even know what a word, a proper term for it. Uh, American English we call red light district. Yeah. Yeah. There's one in uh, yeah. Copenhagen, I remember. Yeah. Anyway, I was just curious, I think, to yeah. see some of the work in one of those settings could be yeah. fascinating. It would be really interesting. Well, I had a, um, obviously, I've been thinking about it, and then I was thinking about how in the part of the world where I live, because I know it's definitely not the case in many other parts yes, of the world. Yes, very much true. Um, I had a feeling that being naked in public space was less needed than having like in-depth reflection on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then you have the feminine movement or you have like in Russia, uh, the guy who nailed his scrotum into the Red Square as a protest against yes. the police violence. So you, you have like in places in the world where uh, sexuality and nudity is definitely not um, uh, a possibility <laughs> in public space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and where the political side of it is has a very, very strong very impact. Very strong. But I had a feeling that in Denmark, I I don't my need. People in luck or I don't know. What do you think? I had a feeling that it wouldn't. Um, yeah, it's like some. It's a battle that has, in a way, been fought. You been feel. fought. Yeah. And that there's maybe another battle. Um, there's for sure still lots of battles to sure. to be fought. But well, it is so interesting. I mean, you can be in the public. Yeah. Um, in France, for example, mm. I remember several times um, a television would be on mm -hmm. in, say, a hotel lobby mm -hmm. or, um, you know, all kinds of public places. Yeah. And suddenly pornography comes on, which to an American is so shocking. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, and I remember my first trips to Europe in the 90s and even well into the 2000s being, you know, kind of embarrassed when pornography would come yeah. on, say yeah. at 11 or 12, yeah. in some yeah, place yeah, yeah, yeah. where yeah. TV just was yeah. on, yeah. you know, on a regular channel mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we, you have to make an effort. Mm -hmm. Americans mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. go out of their way to make sure that kind of thing isn't seen. So yeah. it is really interesting to think about that European mm -hmm. mentality mm -hmm. around sex because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a radical proposition, the notion mm -hmm. that there's what we call hardcore porn on mm -hmm. regular television mm -hmm. stations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Granted, after midnight yeah, or yeah. 11 at night or something. but yeah. I think it's also... Um, I mean, because in Six and Nine Positions, I'm performing inside the public, so that was also my way of mm. um, actually like... Because in the other pieces there is a frontality and a distance mm. to the audience, but in in six nine position I'm literally naked in this proximity, yes, yes. and I also even ask people to do an orgy sculpture. Actually, I'm trying to get them to do the blue sculpture. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we we're trying to do that. So I try to do that with the audience, and it, that always creates a lot of negotiation. And and for me, I think my work has a lot to do with. Um, noticing how you negotiate your own limits mm. at least that work has a lot to do with that and for me that's a very political moment this mm. moment where you choose or not to do something right in, in a very simple mm -hmm. sense of the word so um, yeah and I think in public space there would be a little bit you have to be a bit more proclamatory about your mm -hmm. <laughs> your goals and that I, I felt like thing in the 60s that was very strong. I for me, it, f it felt a little bit like can't do that now. Have to have to mm -hmm, <laughs> more mm -hmm. subtle, or it needs to it needs to be mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, that's super mm -hmm. fascinating.